Um, my name is uh, Tim Benapal. I'm a consultant medical oncologist. I work in London at St George's University Hospital, um, and I've been asked to talk about the role of adjuvant immunotherapy in lung cancer. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we've just heard from Giannis how much a lung cancer treatment has changed uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. And obviously these changes are always initially in the metastatic setting. And it's true to say historically uh, that the role of adjuvant therapy in lung cancer has been very limited. But of course, with all the progress and understanding of lung cancer and the biology behind it, um, these uh, changes are now start to progress into uh, early stage therapy. This rather busy slide is just really to demonstrate that uh, the lung cancer staging system, uh, as, as with the recent eighth edition, has become increasingly complex. And this reflects uh, the level of sophistication we now have in diagnosing our patients and staging them uh, prior to potential surgery. And um, I'm not gonna sit and go through all the details. You're all very familiar, I'm sure, with the staging system, but a number of key changes uh, did result in certain uh, um, disease stages being upstaged. Um, this is just a standard uh, lymph node uh, thoracic map. And of course, those of us who treat lung cancer are very familiar with it. Um, and it's a key uh, diagram really to understand uh, which are the patients that are clearly going to be potentially operable, which are the borderline patients and which patients are inoperable. And of course, the, uh, the line of which transects all of this is N2 disease which remains a controversial uh, subject. Um, N2 obviously is uh, mediastinal uh, nodal disease. And of course, there is a wide variety of opinion and debate as to the role of surgery in, uh, in perhaps single station N2 disease versus the role of chemo radiotherapy and of course now maintenance divulimab, uh, given the uh, significant survival advantage the latter has, has demonstrated. In my um, multidisciplinary meeting, which we have in the UK, where we sit and discuss all our cases, I have five dedicated thoracic cancer surgeons. And uh, it is quite clear that uh, compared to historically uh, in, in the modern era, we now have to very aggressively uh, stage uh, patients uh, who are potentially operable. And of course, this staging is uh, centered around the mediastinum. And it's important to understand that if there is suggestion of N2 or N3 disease, preoperative, uh, very careful assessment is essential uh, to avoid uh, operating unnecessarily and to avoid de declining an operation from someone who might otherwise advantage. Now, all of our patients who are considered for surgery um, have to uh, have their risk of surgery assessed. And as we all know, uh, some of these patients have a number of comorbidities and the decision to send someone down an operative pathway can sometimes be very complex. Obviously, some of our patients have concurrent cardiac uh, comorbidities. They also often have uh, COPD, um, they have limited lung function. And so there's quite an intensive process uh, before considering surgery in these patients that often involves uh, some degree of pulmonary rehabilitation, assessment of formal uh, pulmonary function tests and exercise tolerance, and a very careful assessment of, of comorbidities. However, it is true to say um, that the surgical resection rate over the last few years in the United Kingdom has improved because historically it was it was really appalling. And this is largely as a result of better staging, um, more dedicated thoracic uh, um, oncology surgeons, uh, and also a much better understanding of operative techniques. Um, as with all other tumor types, um, the goal is to uh, obtain an R0 resection um, where no residual macroscopic uh, tumor remains with negative margins. And it's no surprise to know that if R0 resections are not achieved, then survival uh, becomes compromised. 
I think it's important to understand uh, the terminology uh, around surgery and obviously uh, in all tumour types, the concept of neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy uh, ha have been around for a long time and they, offer, they are often um, compared. Neoadjuvant, strictly speaking, refers to a patient who is technically operable, but the choice is made to give systemic treatment before considering surgery, where obviously adjuvant therapy is the systemic treatment is given after surgery. And of course, there are advantages and disadvantages of taking either one of these approaches. And historically, in lung cancer, um, both approaches have been tried. But previously, many years ago, a neoadjuvant therapy in lung cancer uh, was tried. Uh, there were a number of concerns about the fact that there was not a significant response rate to chemotherapy. Some of these patients had tumours that were borderline operable, and the fear would be that uh, by the time chemotherapy was given, the patients would become inoperable. Um, however, I think that as I'm going to demonstrate in this talk, uh, in, in our um, with our modern therapies, I think that that changes. Obviously, another advantage of neoadjuvant therapy is that uh, if you get a response, you know that that patient is actually benefiting directly. And with adjuvant therapy, that's not easy to assess. Um, if you sum up uh, all of the historical trials adjuvantly and neoadjuvantly uh, in lung cancer, uh, they're consistent in showing uh, a 5% uh, advantage. Uh, in terms of survival with adjuvant therapy as per the LACE meta-analysis in 2008 and the more recent meta-analysis of 15 randomized studies published in The Lancet in 2014 of neoadjuvant chemotherapy again showed uh, a 5% a, a survival advantage. But uh, this is where the benefit of chemotherapy alone uh, stops um, and this is why we're discussing uh, this topic today. Um, when we speak to our patients, uh, however we wish to, to uh, describe it, we tend to uh, explain that if they've had surgery and they come and see us for some form of adjuvant therapy, our principle that is driving uh, the adjuvant therapy here is that they have residual micrometastatic disease. And of course, we would refer to the fact that we would be using chemotherapy to, uh, to mop up the residual cells. But of course, the concept of using the patient's immune system uh, to do that, when you think about it carefully, um, is probably much more sophisticated than four cycles of chemotherapy and doesn't necessarily have a time limit uh, to the potential benefit uh, given the mechanism. So I'm going to talk mainly about this study and just mention another uh, neoadjuvant study, but this is the Empower uh, uh, 010 study um, and essentially it met its primary endpoint uh, which we'll go into detail uh, in the following slides. So this was uh, a randomized uh, study, and this were patients who were potentially uh, operable and had tumors resected from stage 1b to 3a, um, and they were of good performance status. Uh, they either had lobectomy or pneumonectomy, and they had tumor tissue available for pdl one analysis. Patients then received uh, between one and four cycles of histology-based adjuvant chemotherapy. And note the number at that stage is 1,280. Uh, and then were randomized to either uh, best supportive care uh, or uh, single agent atezolizumab, um, three weekly for 16 cycles, which is approximately a year. And this was 1,005 patients. So this was a big study. There were a number of stratification factors, including gender, stage, histology, and pd one expression. But the primary endpoint here was the uh, disease-free survival, which was tested in a hierarchical basis, which I will go into uh, a bit later on. And secondary endpoints were overall survival um, and three- and five-year disease-free survival. This was, as I said, a hierarchical uh, design, which essentially meant uh, the first endpoint was studied, and if positive, the second one was analyzed, and, and then the third one. And in the case of the first endpoint, this was disease free survival in PDL1 expressing patients who are stage 2 to 3A. Um, as you can see from this rather busy table, uh, the point of this, uh, to, to show you this, is that this uh, cohort of patients probably does reflect a real world uh, uh, patient populations. Um, you can see here that 65% uh, were non-squamous um, histology, which is more or less reflective of, uh, of uh, practice. 
And you can see that the majority of patients for stage 3A um, comprising 41.1% of patients. Uh, you can see that uh, about 54% of patients had any pdl one expression, and this is slightly different from the metastatic setting where it's probably a little bit higher, it's more 65-70% with any pdl one expression, and 11% or 117 patients were EGFR mutation positive, and 3% uh, 3 were ALK uh, positive. So if we look at the primary uh, endpoint of disease-free survival, and this is in a pdl one expressing population, to be clear, um, stage 2 to 3A, you can see quite clearly from this DFS uh, curve that there's a very significant survival advantage uh, to the patients who, uh, who uh, received um, adjuvant uh, atezolizumab. And in terms of adjuvant therapy uh, um, curves, this uh, for me I think is a game changer. You can see at 24 months there's a 13% um, a disease-free survival advantage and a 12% advantage at 36 months um, with a significant uh, hazard ratio and p-value. And I, and I think this message alone uh, is very clear and unambiguous that our practices uh, will and should be changing in the near future. If you look at all the specified subgroups, the benefit is more or less um, uh, across all of these subgroups, uh, perhaps with the exception of the ALK uh, positive patients who are small in number. Um, this being met, the second endpoint was then analysed, and this was disease-free survival in all randomised patients from stage 2 to 3A, so that includes the pdl one negative patients. And you can see, uh, even if negative patients are included, although numerically a little bit less, there is a clear separation of these curves, which is statistically sig significant. Again, telling us that there is a clear signal uh, suggesting that the adjuvant immuno immunotherapy has a clear biological advantage. And again, uh, this advantage was across most of the subgroups uh, as per the study. And if we look at disease-free survival in the entire population, which was the next endpoint, which, which then extended to include stage 1b to 3a and any pd one expression, you can see once again, while the curves are uh, not quite as separated, they remain uh, separate with somewhere in the region of a 7 or 8% advantage uh, at 24 months and uh, a 5 to 6% advantage at 36 months. So again, a clear demonstration um, that there is a, a, a biological signal uh, affecting survival by the use of adjuvant immunotherapy. If we look at the early overall survival data, the graph on the left represents uh, patients with 1% or more pdl one expression, stage 2 to 3A. And whilst it's not reaching statistical significance at this point, there's certainly a suggestion that in that group of patients, the survival curves are separating. Um, if you look at all randomised patients in the intention to treat population, uh, the curves are not uh, separate at this point. Um, we, in adjuvant therapy, you have to think about safety, and um, reassuringly, the, the uh, adverse effects were pretty much as predicted uh, from the use of immunotherapy in the metastatic setting. Um, and you can see that grade three or four immune-mediated events were, were relatively low in percentage at 7.9%. Um, and this is all in keeping with the toxicity that we're very used to manage in the metastatic setting. Um, and again, looking at um, grade three and four uh, specific immune related events, again, manageable and uh, thankfully low percentages, uh, suggesting that delivery of adjuvant immunotherapy should not bring with it uh, a significant amount of additional uh, toxicity. Of course, there were uh, some patients who uh, discontinued, as we know uh, all too well from our metastatic practice, that pa some patients uh, do not. Uh, endure immunotherapy uh, for long periods of time. However, they remain a minority. So from the point of view of this study, I think there are some really key points uh, that need to, uh, to be summarised. Um, atezolizumab is the first and only uh, immunotherapy to date to demonstrate a significant reduction in the risk of disease recurrence. And this is in patients with pdl one expression of 1% or more, stage 2 to 3A, uh, when given after uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. 
It did meet its primary endpoint, uh, demonstrating a 34% re reduction in the risk of disease recurrence uh, in the pd one positive population. I think it's quite clear that this is uh, this is a very meaningful uh, advantage, given that the advantage the chemotherapy uh, adds as well. And I think it's probably fair to say that the the benefit is consistent across histologies and and, and most of the subgroups that were analysed. And I think that's very important uh, in this setting um, because obviously, if the advantage was only in a small subset of patients, this wouldn't change practice in the same way. Um, overall survival uh, remains uh, unclear, and I think it'll be several years before we demonstrate clearly whether um, overall survival is affected. Um, I think it's clear to say that single agent atezolizumab is safe and tolerable uh, with manageable toxicity, which we're very familiar with. And I personally think that this uh, will certainly have an impact on our uh, potential standard of care. But I think it is important um, to highlight that the, the neoadjuvant uh, approach is also ongoing. And it's true to say that currently, both neoadjuvantly and adjuvantly, there are a large number of clinical trials uh, yet uh, to report. So I think this landscape is going to get uh, much, much busier in the near future. And I suspect, as we, as we demonstrated in the metastatic setting, um, we will see a plethora of evidence that uh, immunotherapy is going to have a role one way or another in early stage therapy. This, uh, uh, this trial is Checkmate 816, 816, and this was a neoadjuvant study, so there are some key differences, obviously, here. Um, and this was a 358 patients, and these were patients uh, diagnosed with 1B to 3A uh, receptable tumours, uh, with an ECOG performance status of 0 to 1, um, who, and the patients with oncogenic driver disease were excluded in this study. Um, and the patients were randomized to neoadjuvant chemotherapy for three cycles, or neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus, <coughs> excuse me, single agent uh, nivolumab in combination uh, for three cycles. Patients were then restaged and, uh, and um, then as offered surgery uh, with the option of further adjuvant therapy if appropriate. And I think we've got to understand that in neoadjuvant studies, primary endpoints differ. And of course, uh, looking for uh, disease free survival is not necessarily the right primary endpoint. So in this study, what was being looked at here was the, the degree of pathological response. And as you can see from, um, from this next slide, this uh, is showing in green the patients who had chemo and nivolumab. Um, and in, if you look at early stage 1B disease, there's a 40% complete pathological response to neoadjuvant therapy for three cycles, which I personally think is quite astonishing. Um, and if you look again as, as the, stage advantage, uh, the stage advances, there's still a very, very clear difference in the pathological complete response rate between chemo and nivolumab or chemotherapy alone. And again, this waterfall plot is just demonstrating much the same thing. And again, you can see from this uh, plot that if patients are getting Nevo plus chemo um, prior to surgery, there is a, there, there's clearly a symbiotic or synergistic role of combining chemo and immunotherapy in getting early tumor shrinkage. Um, and uh, as you can see, particularly in the stage 3A curve, there's quite a significant reduction in tumour burden uh, before surgery with this approach. And once again, um, it will become clear, in the, uh, I think, over the next uh, short number of years, uh, which patients we may be selecting for um, neoadjuvant therapy versus adjuvant therapy. And I think that will be a very significant topic of debate. Um, it goes without saying that although we're talking about immunotherapy, I do think that the, that the adjuvant uh, landscape uh, has already changed in other aspects of non-small cell lung cancer. And the clear example of that, of course, is the use of adjuvant ozimertinib with, with really, really jaw-dropping uh, uh, improvements in survival with the use of those targeted therapies. So in summary, I think uh, what was historically a very limited uh, environment of four cycles of adjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy, our early stage uh, paradigm or treatment pathway is going to change very significantly and ultimately, hopefully, will have a very significant impact uh, on the outcome for lung cancer patients. 
Um, that is my final slide, and I thank you very much for your time.